then and uh, we have two speakers today, uh, Javier de la Rosa and uh, Peter Leonard. Uh, so Javier, I think we'll start in with you. Is that right? Yep, that's okay. Let me share my screen. <laughs> okay. Uh, hello everyone. I am Javier de la Rosa, research scientist at the National Library of Huawei AI Lab. I'm going to be briefly introducing the topic of ASR and then giving a broad overview of the ASR activities at the National Library of Norway. For those of you that don't know, ASR is the acronym of Automatic Speech Recognition, which is a branch of uh, a bigger field called speech uh, processing. And Automatic Speech Recognition is focused on converting spoken words into text. Um, generally, that involves some sort of automat automated model or system by means of a computer. So the usual process goes like this. You have an audio clip of someone speaking, could be noisy, could be part of lyrics, could be a different kind of environment, different tones, modalities, and all of that. But in general, you have someone speaking in a language. Because there are a few samples. Going along slushy country roads and speaking to damp audiences in drafty schoolrooms day after day for a fortnight. He'll have to put in an appearance at some place of... This is a very clear speech of someone speaking in English. So when you uh, feed that out of clip to an ASR model or system, what you get back is a transcript. Now there are different ways in which the transcript might be produced. It could be... Uh, normalized and normalization also have different levels so you might have for example strip up all the uppercase letter all the punctuation marks converted all the numbers to the spelled out uh, form you could convert all the currency symbols also to the word expressing those symbols so there are different levels of normalization that will also be applied and depending on the model and the technology you might have those things always spelled out or maybe transformed into the actual symbols that you were expecting. That also happened for dates, times, currency, numbers, uh, years, and things like that. In the brief history of ASR, which maybe we can even date back to the Bell Labs experiments with recognizing digits, uh, the, the field has been really focused on telephone conversations and number identification and intent, intent recognition. That is when you are talking on the telephone and you have an assistant and the assistant tells you, okay, if you want to do a local transfer, press one. If you want to speak to an agent, press two. And then... There was a, an evolution on that in which you could actually say the number like two or yes or no, very short, very short words. So there was a whole um, a whole research field trying to trying to tackle that that problem. And then if we fast forward a little bit to to the period around the two thousand, we started to see things uh, like uh, talking heads assistance uh, with new technology popping up. Like we got also the dictation dictation software. So like the Dragon Dragon, I think it was Dragon dictation software in which it was a system that tried to understand what people were saying, but it was a little bit rudimentary. So you have to really speak really clear. You also have to train the model with your own voice because it was not able to adjust easily to different voices. And then around the 2010, Apple released uh, Siri, which was one of the first uh, voice assistants in, in, in the market. And then after that, we got the Amazon Zico, Microsoft Cortana, and around 2016, we got a, a revolution in, in the way we were doing the ASR all together. Before I talk about the, the modern approaches 
to ASR, the, the basic assumption in the classical way of approaching this problem was that there is a, um, a projection between the phoneme and the grapheme, that is between the actual sounds, the uterans, and the letters that are written out. So the idea was to find the closest mapping in a dictionary of either phonemes and also words. And while that might be true, for languages like Esperanto, in which one letter roughly has one single uh, sound, for most of the natural languages occurring in the world is a little bit more problematic than that. And that is uh, because there is this concept of orthographical depth. So languages with very deep orthography means that they are very highly irregular, they are very complex. So there is no a one-to-one -one projection between what you say and what is actually transcribed. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have shallow orthography, which means languages that are highly regular. So the way you speak is easily transcribed to the way you write them. And somewhat in between, you have like the medium uh, depth, medium deep orthography languages, like for example, Spanish or Portuguese, and in some cases are also Norwegian. This is a sample uh, of a single sentence in Norwegian. It says, ja, ja, well, this litten, uh, which means I am very tired. Um, um, those two words at the end were selected because they, they are spelled out very differently depending on the specific dialects. For example, in Oslo, the word for I and am can be roughly similar, but then the words for very untired sound completely different. I'm not very good at telling uh, these words in Norwegian, but in Oslo, it sounds something like Beldi and Sliten, and in the Nordmore dialect in the north of the country, it sounds more like Shora and Kroar, even though they are still transcribed as the same word, right? So uh, wh when the depth of the language is very big, is the, the task of ASR gets even more complicated than that. So if we zoom in a little bit into the last uh, 20, 23 years, we see that most of the advances were done in the assistance uh, space uh, with the emerging technology of this deep speech around 2016. It was a revolution because it employed very efficiently and practically deep learning technology in an end-to-end -end speech recognition system. In this case, it was for English and Mandarin. So it was end-to-end -end trained, meaning that you had only your data, and then you fed the data with no complicated feature extraction from the text or feature extraction or calculation of Fourier transformation from the audio. You just fed the data, audio clips and text, and you got an ASR system that was actually beating all the other previously uh, state-of-the-art uh, approaches. Deep speech did not need any sort of hand design components. Um, it actually didn't even have the concept of a phoneme, because it was all fed directly into a simpler architecture, which in this case was a regular recurrent neural network. And it, it was able to handle very challenging scenarios like with noisy, uh, with noise and background noise uh, reverberation, and even speaker variation, which was uh, very problematic before this technology came in. They report their like really impressive results. Again, this is like eight years old now uh, with a word error rate, which is a metric we use to, to get an idea of how good the model is. So the lower the ratio of errors you have in your words is usually the better. So they reach a 16% for English and Mandarin, and that was state of the art back then. After that, new approaches in the way they were uh, constructing this model started to leverage the transformer uh, architecture. Um, waf to bag was also a really step forward because they started building what is known as the acoustic model. So using self-supervised learning instead of directly training a system like ESR, they built an acoustic, an acoustic model that could be adjusted or fine-tuned for other tasks down the road. So you build an acoustic model based purely on unlabeled audio speech data, just 
on the waveforms. If you record uh, your voice in a voice recorder in your laptop, the file, if it's not MP3, because MP3 is, is a compressed version of the of the waveform, but the, the raw waveform is usually saved as a WAV, which is a WAV file. That's like the raw and compressed waveform of whatever you are um, producing. So and this model was able to take that as an input directly, mask out a few chunks of that, and it was trained to predict those chunks in the same in the same vein that other models did before, like like Bird. Um, while the masking out was uh, actually one of the improvements of the version two of this technology, uh, waf to uh, put already in place very similar approaches in the version one of of their solution. A natural evolution of this was was data to vec which took these ideas from text and vision and speech and created one single multi-modality architecture. That doesn't mean that a model trained on the three modalities is going to be a multi-modal, a multi-modality model. It's only that the architecture is capable of handling a training on speech or a training on vision or a training on text, but still, once you train a model using data to back, it's going to be a single modality. But they were able to get an architecture capable of, of being trained for the three different modalities using the same idea like masking out words, masking out patches on an image, or masking out chunks of the, of the speech uh, signal. Um, what about Norwegian ESR? Norwegian ESR around the 90s started to be somewhat active. Uh, in the region, there are at least two different ways in which some numbers can be expressed, which is a bit problematic for automatic speech recognition on telephone conversations. Um, for like a couple of decades, that was the main focus of the research in, in our way, being able to have uh, conversations over the telephone and identify an intent and basic commands with very limited lexicon and vocabularies and also natural numbers, right? And then around the year 2000, a company called Nordisk uh, Sprach Technology, um, they came up with a very ambitious plan to be like a Nordic uh, language technology uh, focused on automatic speech recognition. They build very big data sets for that, taking into account numbers, spelling out of words, dictation. Uh, really, really uh, ambitious company, but unfortunately they went bankrupt. And the data at that point was uh, kind of lost for a period of time. Then after the year 2000, some um, research on, on Norway also tackled the talking head uh, agents, the phone agents, the voice commands and, and things like that. But on, on, on the front of general conversation, understanding and following, uh, there was not a lot of progress until the year 2021, when a team at the National Library of Norway, the, the language bank uh, put together after months and months of work, they transcribe uh, a number of hours, I think it's around like a hundred or something hours of parliamentary speeches. So they put together all of that, they transcribe, they correct it, and they release a data set called the Norwegian Parliament Speech Corpus. And that happens almost coincidentally with the release of FLEORS. FLEORS is the the, the voice equivalent of Flores, and um, Flores is a data set for machine translation of text. So they took a few of the samples from that data set for textual machine translation and had native speakers uh, produce the text on those samples. And then with those recordings, they released a multilingual data set for, for speech, uh, for automatic speech recognition. The amount of data in flares for Norwegian is not great, it's not big. It also contains a few errors, but it is uh, one of the best cases there are for Norwegian in terms of out of domain data that we have because the training data was not enough to create a, a, a good performing 
ASR model for, for Norwegian, but it was really good to test out of domain once we train, for example, on data sets like the MPSE. The NST data was uh, fortunately recovered by a, a joint effort by the University of Oslo, Bergen, and the NU and the Language Council and also IBM. They jointly bought all the linguistic resources developed uh, by this uh, uh, bankrupt company. And after some time reorganizing and cleaning, uh, the whole data set ended up in the National Library of Norway under the Language Bank. Um, it's now freely available for even for commercial use. It's, it's, it is licensed as a CC0, I think. So that's a resource we didn't have before, and it, it, it just became available right at the same time that the Norwegian Parliamentary Speech Corpus also became available. In the paper presenting the corpus, the authors also did a couple of experiments, testing variations of these uh, of models trained using this data set. Although their splits they used are not publicly available and they're, they're, it's not easy to replicate in that sense because, for example, they did not split the NPSC into the two official languages in Norway, which are Bokmal and, 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 and Ninos. So at uh, that point in time, now we are fast uh, forward into uh, 2022 and under a uh, community event sponsored by Hagen Face and Google, we decided that we wanted to give it a go and create a Norwegian waf to vec 2.0 model. So at that time, we did our own research and we found out that there, were, there was no competitive Norwegian model for ASR, at least not based on waf to vec 2.0. So we had uh, just really three options. We have a multilingual version of waf to vec 2.0, which was released by Facebook and trained on, I think, like a 50 or 60 uh, languages. We had an acoustic model, no ASR, just the acoustic modeling of a Swedish model released by the National Library of Sweden. And then we have these small models uh, released by the authors of the NPSC the, um, corpus. So we did some experiments mixing the MPSE corpus with the Swedish acoustic model and also with the multilingual uh, waf to vec version uh, of, the, of, of the model. And we got really, really good results that, um, that basically uh, led us to believe that we could do even better. So we run more experiments on that, now mixing the data from the NST and also doing evaluations on the, on the FLAOS data set. And we also added, where we also added, uh, we added language models, but not language models in the sense of uh, BERT or GPT, but uh, uh, basic five gram necessary language models uh, with the idea of being able to fix the mistakes that were made by the purely acoustic um, waf to vec models. So these are very small models that you train on naturally occurring uh, text. Uh, we got, uh, we randomly sampled text from the training set of the Norwegian Parliament Speech Corpus and also the Norwegian Colossal Corpus, which is a corpus that we released uh, a year, a couple of years uh, ago. And then we apply that to the waf to vec models, throw up uh, a, a loss function known as the CTC, which is the connectionist temporal uh, classification. So that is giving you some information that you can use to plug a five gram language model or a four gram language model. And it's going to be fixing the outputs of the ASR model. We got really good results. Uh, we were able to boost even, uh, even for the smaller models, which we based on the on the Swedish model. I mean, Swedish is, uh, is, is close to Norwegian, but it's obviously a different language. But even though we train on the acoustic model for Swedish, fine tuning on Norwegian data, we got really good results for Norwegian book model and also for, uh, for uh, Ninos. And obviously the 
the bigger the model usually the better but it also comes with some um with some uh, gotchas because when when we mix together the norwegian parliament speech corpus which contains as i said norwegian and bokmal it was really good for bokmal but it was not performing so well when you put the two together which makes sense because the model was producing already just bokmal and not and not was producing uh Ninorsk. We also got good results for the Ninorsk uh, models that we train. We train again a small and, and, and a big model, 300 million parameters and 1 million parameters. Uh, we got uh, really good results. This is a, a, a percentage of word error rate. So this is like 12 error rate and 12% error rate and 11.5 word error rate. And I'm adding here at the end uh, the only existing alternatives that. Uh, that were out there when we started doing this experiment. So we were really, really uh, boosting the quality of ESR in for for Norwegian when we released uh, these models. This is like a almost like a twofold uh, improvement. And when compared in out of domain, this is uh, like zero shot. So the models have never been data that look like flares, although it's closer to the MPSC than it is to the NST data set, we were also able to get uh, under 10% word error rate for, for the flares uh, data set. There are, uh, we ran an error analysis on this. Um, there are uh, errors that the language model, for, for example, introduced uh, because when the language model has not seen very specific sets of engrams is going to is going to fix it in the wrong way. And though the model believes that that's what should be, it, it turns out that sometimes it's introducing errors. But the good news is that it fixes more errors than it introduces. Because the data be Bokmal and Ninorsk, we found that when there is Ninorsk mixed in the context, the model kind of struggle to continue to continue producing uh, uh, text in Ninorsk. And sometimes it was just over uh, over uh, producing the text in the in the incorrect uh, language. Also statistical plausible occurrences that it could happen that also sound very, very similar to the ear. Uh, some acoustic misinterpretations, for example, like this one here at the end with the horn. If I play this, there is like a like an aspiration because is the, the person is just taking some breath, breathing some air to continue speaking, but the audio clip was cut at that point, and the model thinks that what comes after that is naturally a heart, which means a masha mohar. Also, dialect differences when one's Speaking. This uh, should be, uh, yes, good morning, president. And then there are, the model is uh, basically doing something that doesn't look a lot like what the target looks like. And we also found some incorrect target data. Uh, so there are some spellings of words that are, are actually correctly produced by the model with or without uh, the language model that were not correct into the, the, the target. And some normalization mishaps that we introduced because normalizing is a, is a non-trivial task, even though it might look like one, it, it really is not. So we made a, the mistake of normalizing the, for example, here with the abbreviated version. So the model was always producing F-E-K-S instead of the, for example, thing all the time. Um, while sometimes that's like, that is exactly what you want for a model that is primarily acoustic, it should have been the spell that way of, of, of saying, for example. So after that, we believe that we are contributing to the Norwegian ESR uh, research, uh, at least in, in Norway. But we were also wondering if this approach yet would work for low resource uh, languages. So in that regard, we have been working with Sami languages as well. So there are three Sami languages with an official status in Norway. That those are South Sami, Lule Sami, and North Sami. 
Um, they are considered equal languages legally in, in Norway, although the official languages are just uh, Nynorsk and um, Bokmal. And they are spoken mostly in the, in the north of the country, while uh, um, South Sami is also uh, spoken in, in Troms and Figmar, Nordland and in the Trondelag. So at that point in time, the whisper model was released. Uh, I know that Peter will be giving a deep dive into how whisper works. I will just say that whisper is uh, not using the raw waveform, is not using the, the, the raw signal as it is, but using a, an, a spectrogram of the signal, which, which allows you to see all the different frequencies by time. So it's using that as an input to the system, and then it's being trained also end to end. But this model is not a purely acoustic model. That means that its sole purpose, in theory, is just to do automatic speech recognition. Now this model is really powerful because because it's also able to do not only transcription of a language into text, but also translation. And people are using and. This model became very popular. It's a good model, but they are really pushing this model to the limits with diarization rotation, with uh, timestamps production, because the model is able to produce all the timestamps. It does inverse text normalization, so that you get a properly formatted text back. You get uh, question marks, commas, periods, so capital letters, and uh, and all of that. Um, even sometimes you may even get like uh, music symbols when transcribing the lyrics of a song. So the model is really good at discriminating between noise and actual signal. So we tested our models, which are of a different nature and different sizes. And we were uh, beating the small models and getting really, really close to the, to the large ones, even though our web to -web models were in nature different and also a bit smaller than the largest model uh, released by OpenAI. So the, the, the problem with WAF to back is that it needs a lot of data to first build the acoustic model. So we don't have that for Sami. This, these languages are spoken by like 7,000 uh, people. Uh, the, the most spoken of the, of the languages, which is uh, Northern Sami. So we really don't have that kind of data for low resource languages. So what we did instead was using the closest language that Whisper has support for. In this case was uh, Finnish. They're both like Finno-Ugric languages. So we used we use, uh, Finnish and then try to replace all the internal weights that Whisper has for Finnish with data for Sami. So we did uh, a few experiments using, I think it was like 20 hours of North Sami uh, speech, which is not a lot by any means. And we were able to get a model that was producing a water rate of below 25%. Now for people, uh, anything below three, two percent is almost like as good as a human or even better, but, um, if for Norwegian, there was no good performing model. For Sami, there was just no model at all. So when we talked to the community and a couple of other actors involved in this, like the, uh, the group of uh, Divon in Trumso and the Arctic University, the Jalat and the group went there, they were really enthusiastic about the results. And they have been actually using this model to ease the transcriptions of more data. So the idea is that we're using this model, which is not great, but it's good to make it easy for native speakers to produce more transcripts so we can train even better models for, for, for Sami. Now in a comparison against WAF2 to back to, you can see that Whisper in general makes uh, fewer mistakes. This is just one of the, oops. This is just one of the samples. I don't speak uh, Sami at all. Yeah, the bossu tave piekka nu karsi ko sahti, mutta ma li enes on bossu tadi chauka le apa vanta deti kiesa ja kedspeita. But they were really hopeful that the kind of mistakes 
that Whisper was producing were also easy to fix using things like orthographic checkers and grammar checkers and things like that, because there, are, there, there, are, uh, there is a set of tools built on rule, like rule-based systems for grammar checking and orthography checking that they apply to the outputs of Whisper and a very early initial experiment on waf 2 back And they found out that it was just easier to fix Whisper than it was to fix uh, waf 2 back That's probably because they didn't have a good language model, Fibram or Enneagram in general for waf 2 back But in any case, those were really good results for, for, Whisper, for Whisper. So what's next for that? We are now scaling up training with uh, TPUs. We are collecting a really big, really big 100% labeled data set for Norwegian. And the idea is that we will be able to release models, uh, really good performing models, uh, whisper models for Norwegian, a batch of model in all sizes during the summer, and hopefully all of them will be finished by, by the fall. Thank you.